Давайте я еще раз представлю. Это Джефф Паттон, человек, которого мы звали три года приехать в Россию. И, наконец, он согласился это сделать. Человек, который в 2007 году получил свою первую награду за вклад вообще в развитие Agile сообщества, за вклад именно в продуктовую разработку. Да? То есть если Agile в основном мы привыкли воспринимать как процессы, то Джефф в основном говорит а, с точки зрения именно разработки продуктов. So, Джефф, I'm welcome you. You can, you can start. Good. Ready? Доброе утро. My feeble attempt at speaking Russian. That's all you'll get. <laughs> all right, where to start? I've been involved with Agile development since there has been Agile software development. I started with a company in the year 2000, and I'd been recruited, uh, well, recruited into the company because I had built successful products in their same industry. And the company w was trying this interesting new process called extreme programming. They'd hired a person named Kent Beck, who had written a book called Extreme Programming Explained. And they'd hired a, a team of really fabulous engineers. And they'd brought together a team of really smart people who, who knew a lot about uh, software, who knew a lot about products in this area. And I was one of those. Well, uh, that was 2000. And the, the term Agile was coined in 2001, and extreme programming was one of those Agile processes. But I will, uh, so I'll, let me start by saying I'm a bad person to speak at an Agile conference, because I've hated Agile development since the very first day I started it. <laughs> When I started in Agile development, I started in extreme programming at least, they presented me with a choice. They, they said, Uh, you can be a, what's called a, a customer, uh, someone in the XP customer role, or you can be a developer. And I said, well, uh, it's your lucky day. I can do both. And they said, no, no. In agile development, you either need to be a customer or a developer. And developers write code, and they talk with customers, and customers make decisions about what to build. And I said, gosh, I, I gave it a lot of thought. And I, I said, you know, what I mo like most is making products for people. And uh, the, for me, making means getting my hands dirty and getting involved with the code. It also means talking with customers. And well, when I worked in the 1990s, just because I was a developer didn't mean I didn't get to talk with customers. In fact, uh, I made sure that all the developers got to talk with customers. And I read all the XP books, who said, then they said developers talk with customers. So I said, I've given a lot of thought, and I will be a developer. And they said, no, you can't be a developer, because you're actually not good enough compared to our really good developers. And you know way too much about uh, products in this area, so you'll have to be a customer. Um, I then learned that in extreme programming and in agile processes, the way the customer and well, the way the product owner role works today is we get a very smart person, and we put them in a room with a team, And we expect that one very smart person to have all the answers and to describe a perfect product that the developers build. And uh, then they go to work and build it, and the product is successful. It does not work that way. How many people here uh, in the room have sat with one of your customers or end users, sat with them or sat behind them, and watched them use a product that you've built before? That's enough. Uh, uh, it's enough people in the room. Um, think back to the, maybe the first time you did that. How well did that go? Did it go great? Yeah, good. That's the nervous laugh I was looking for. Uh, the, the sad truth is, well, it almost always goes poorly. The decisions we make uh, about what to build, well, those are the most difficult decisions. And they're often, if not always, wrong the first time. They're not completely wrong, they're just a lot wrong, and that's not, doesn't make it, well, it makes the hard part the work we have to do to keep working directly with customers and users to get it right. So let's, let me dig in. I've got a, long, a lot to talk about, and I want to talk about where I see agile development going. I've been in Agile development now for you know, close to 12, well, like from 2000 until now, I guess 13 years. 
and I've been lucky enough to see, the, the, see it grow up, and I've seen a couple of things happen. I've seen it become very dysfunctional in some ways, and I've seen other groups of people really become enlightened, really, well, really start practicing agile development the way that I had hoped it would be when I first started. I'm going to frame a story in the context of, well, three of the customers I've worked with as a consultant over the past couple years. This is a team at a company in the US called Snag a Job. They're a website that helps people get jobs, but they have a focused market. They focus on people who get hourly wage jobs, uh, people who are uh, baristas at coffee shops, or they work in large retail stores, or uh, fast food restaurants. So uh, there's a lot of jobs that, that they help people get. They also build the systems that uh, companies use to onboard and hire employees. Uh, you know, for instance, Burger King restaurants in the United States will use systems that Snag a Job creates. And this is a picture of a team at a stand-up meeting. And I remember coming to this team, and they were really depressed. Uh, they were really depressed because they were failing. And they all felt bad about it. They all felt responsible. And well, from an agile perspective, that didn't make sense. The team was very good at, well, they understood their product well. When they planned at the beginning of a sprint or a, an iteration, they could effectively plan. They could effectively predict how much they would get done. They finished everything they planned predictably, sometimes a little bit more. They released product all the way to the market every single week and sometimes multiple times a week. And uh, the, the product they released was very good. Well, at least it didn't have a lot of bugs. Uh, it, it performed well. But they were sure that they were failing. This team was seeing success in a very different way than I see most Agile teams. So I'll start with them, and I want to end with talking about them and how they see success. I've got five parts of the talk. I need to spend a little bit of time talking about what's wrong with process. I want to talk about what process success is and isn't. It isn't about safety. I want to talk about what velocity is and isn't. And then I want to talk about the way, well, process was intended to work, the way it really works. It doesn't work the way you think it does. It's a game of invention. And then I want to talk about the kinds of process people like Snagajob are using and others are using to, to actually build products that people like. And then I need to give you the really, really bad news that when you're doing this, it's hard, and it doesn't work a lot. I'm going to talk about uh, snag a job a bit. I'm going to talk about another US, uh, US company called Nordstrom. They're a large department store chain. They're a premium or high-end chain. And then a uh, .com in the US called Edmunds.com. They, they're an automotive website. They're a site I would go to to get information about a car. If, if, well, to make a comparison between cars I'd like to buy and look at past model years and look at service records, things like that. Let's start from the beginning. Processes aren't built for product success. They're built for safety. I'm going to introduce this person here because he works, this is J.B. Brown. He works in an organization, he works in Nordstrom, and his organization has a really strong, rigorous process. In fact, no projects get started at their company without a strong business case. And in that strong business case, uh, I as a business person need to, well, I'd like to get funding for this project, so I need to say this is the project, this is uh, who it's for, and this is the return on investment that I will expect. Now, if I have a great idea, and I don't know if it's going to work, if I want to get some funding to, to do some work to learn if it's going to work, well, the only way to get it through their process is to create a business case, and the business case will ask me to say what the return on investment is, and my only choice is to lie or not to do it at all. And as a result, their rigorous process has successfully stopped all innovation in the company. Nothing, no one tries any new interesting ideas, or at least they didn't, and so the way they've uh, dealt with that is by creating an innovation lab. Now, I've seen a lot of innovation labs come up in some companies, and these are small groups of people that are allowed to break the rules. They're allowed to try out interesting ideas. They're allowed to bypass the normal process. It's an interesting thing to see that we have such strong processes that the only way to be successful is to break them. So the, 
the traditional processes that will require sequence and stage gate are not built for product success, they're, they're built for safety. Let's see if I can explain what I mean by that. By the way, I, I draw a lot uh, uh, to help explain things. The easiest way to do this talk was to, well, draw and show you what I'm drawing. Has, have anyone, has anyone seen a drawing that looks like that before? Say, uh, yeah, and what it was, uh, for those with, uh, that speak English fairly well, what is that usually referred to as? Waterfall model. Uh, the model was originally drawn by a person named Winston Royce. It was put in a, in a paper in the 1970s. This is back when software was created with punch cards and computers were very big things that filled rooms. Uh, Winston Royce drew this model, and part of the reason the model is in a staggered, uh, well, uh, with uh, things going down is uh, because the words that were in each box wouldn't fit on the page if he laid them out left to right. So uh, the easiest way to lay them out was uh, in this shape. He never referred to it as a waterfall. And he drew this drawing with, we, we were doing one thing and handing it down to another. Well, we do requirements and hand that to design, and design we hand to development, development we hand to test, and so on. Now, uh, people that are involved in agile development, uh, that, that model will get demonized a lot. Uh, people will say, oh, there's a lot of reasons that doesn't work. And when I ask people why that doesn't work, they're, they're usually able to say that, it, well, everything takes too long, and the requirements change before we get to the end, and that, uh, well, if there are delays in re the requirements process or the development process, well, no one ever adjusts the schedule and gives us longer for testing. They just squeeze down and do less testing. Now, has anyone ever, anyone in this room ever found that original Royce paper and read the Royce paper? So there's a couple people out there. So those people know that that's not Royce's model. In fact, uh, Royce drew a couple models, and immediately after drawing this model, he explained that it would be great if it worked like that, but that doesn't work. Uh, in fact, um, well, if there, these phases are requirements, design, development, and test, there are feedback loops that need to happen between every phase. We need uh, requirements and design needs to have some period where they're overlapping with each other so that they can communicate effectively and understand each other. And uh, furthermore, it's not until we actually get all the way down to test that we know whether we built the right thing and we have to go all the way back to requirements and rethink things. So in the 1970s, when, well, when software was written with punch cards, when it was truly expensive to buy a computer, and computer time was horribly expensive. People like Royce were trying to say, those straight through processes don't work. We need uh, incremental cycles. We need to learn after we deliver, and don't expect to get it right. But in spite of Royce trying to say that, uh, well, no one really reads. And the, 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 the paper, they saw the first model. It looks like it makes sense, and everybody maybe stopped reading there. Now, it wasn't just Royce doing this. There, there was uh, Royce, there was a, a guy named DeMarco and Lister that wrote a book called uh, People Wear, a guy named Jerry Weinberg that uh, wrote in early days about, about how computer programming worked, a person named Fred Brooks who wrote a book called The Mythical Man Month that talked about a lot of the ideas that, well, he tried to explain that a lot of what we think is true about software development isn't. And then, uh, in the uh, 90s, we started to see the emergence of processes that were considered lightweight development processes. Processes like extreme programming and Scrum and lesser known processes like feature-driven development and the dynamic systems development methodology. And all those lightweight, pro all those people and all those lightweight processes, well, there's been a lot of very smart people trying to tell us, don't use a process that has one step after the other and, and sharp edge stage gates. So uh, it, it's confusing, uh, but I, I'll ask myself, uh, if I assume for a minute that people are not stupid, and that's good, that's yeah, a tough assumption to make, uh, but uh, if people aren't stupid, if we think of the, the model, the one that's just drawn in black there, where I've got requirements and design, and well, if I think of that model that's a sequence, there must be some, something good about it. Why do we keep going back to it in spite of knowing that it doesn't work? And when I ask people that, uh, I'll usually get answers like it's, well, it's, it's easy to understand. 
it makes sense. It, it's easy to plan. I, I know that uh, if there's one step after another, um, I, I know when things will start and stop, and I know I've got these different roles, and uh, I know when I'll need a bunch of testers, I know when I'll need a bunch of developers, and I can figure out how to staff and resource this and really plan how much money this is going to take to do. And eventually, I'll get to people will say, I like this because there are clear roles and responsibility. I know who is accountable at every step of the way. And, well, that uh, clear accountability thing is, that's an interesting thing. We know we're involved in, a, an, in an activity where we are very often wrong about what we're building, where it takes a lot of iteration and cycles to, to make sure that we're building a right, the right thing. And when you get to the end of a cycle, when you show someone you're working software and they're disappointed with it, well, that makes me sad, but it makes people who spent a lot of money really mad. And uh, at the end of the day, we, we kind of, well, we're engaged in a process that's difficult, and I hate coming into work every day feeling bad. If I have clear roles and responsibility, if I know what my job is, then I can do my job well and uh, well, the rest, it'll be the rest of your fault if something goes wrong. At the end of the day, um, it won't be my fault if the, if the project fails. And that's what's nice about having clear roles and responsibilities. If I'm a tester and I'm testing and I'm finding lots and lots of bugs and, uh, and I'm not given enough time, uh, and I'm potentially going to make the project late, it's easy for me to point back up to the developers and say, oh, that's their fault. They, they, built, they put all those bugs in the system. And it's easy for the developers to say, hey, the requirements were very unclear. And we weren't given enough time. And, and that's why all those bugs got in there. And it's easy for people doing requirements to say, well, it's the, 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 it's the user's fault. It's the business fault. They, they changed their mind a lot. And the, the great thing about a waterfall model is, Responsibility goes downhill, and blame goes uphill. It turns out that blame is lighter than air. We should have been filling hot air balloons with blame instead. So there's, if you're a software developer, uh, we'll talk about good design has a separation of concerns. Separation of concerns may lead to good object-oriented designs, but in process, separation of concerns leads to uh, blame. And uh, it doesn't necessarily lead to good products. The pattern that I look for and the pattern that I see in agile development, it tries to break down some of this stuff. But when we look at the customer or product owner and team relationship, it's a client vendor relationship. The way that vendor works is the, the client, well, they describe what they want. And we call those their requirements. And the, the vendor gives back an estimate. Given these are your requirements, this is how long it's going to take me to do it. Now, I'm not sure how the word translates here in Russian. But in America, the word estimate translates to commitment. And it causes people to be really afraid to give an estimate because, well, it doesn't mean estimate anymore. It means if we're wrong, we're in trouble. But uh, we all know that. And given that commitment, the person in the vendor uh, says, OK, please go ahead, build that. And the, the person in the, the vendor role then hands back the product, and the person in the client role says, that's it. That's exactly what I wanted. Only it doesn't go that way. Only at some point in time, the person in the client role says, look, I'm not happy with this. And, and the person in the vendor role can say, well, those were your requirements. That's, that's exactly what you asked for. And the person in the vendor role can say, well, yes, that's what I asked for. But as I use this and see this, it's, it's not what we need. And the person in the vendor role can say, well, what's your point? That makes the person in the client role a little bit frustrated. And they realize that, OK, it's my responsibility to get it right. And if I don't like how slow these guys are and how much it costs, I have found a cheaper way to, to get it wrong. And I can pay people in uh, Vietnam or China less money to do this than I pay you to do it. And that's a problem for people in this role. Uh, so that pattern is the one that plays out over and over. Now let's uh, talk about what's, well, in Agile development, we'll talk about, we'll use that customer and product owner, and we'll try and iterate really fast and build a lot of stuff. And we keep using the term business value over and over and over again. And it just drives me crazy. Uh, there is a belief in Agile development that every backlog item I build 
has value. But the only thing we tend to measure in agile development is velocity. Now, those aren't the same thing. Let me introduce one other person. Uh, this is a person named Eugene. Uh, Eugene is in charge of product management at Edmunds.com. And Edmunds called me up a few years ago to, to get some help in making some process improvement. They were already really good at agile development. They were so good at agile development that they realized it didn't matter. That the more crap they delivered, the more crap they got. And uh, they weren't getting more customers. People didn't like their product more. Uh, people didn't, well, they didn't, they, didn't, they didn't earn more money. They just had more software to maintain. So for everyone here, I need you to understand that you're not here to build software. Your job is to change the world. Now that might sound big and that might sound lofty, but the truth is that's what we're doing. Now let me give you the simple model I draw for people over and over and over, and it's the one that organizes things in my head the best. If I think of the world as it is now, I find that there are people in the world that are unhappy. They're unhappy with the products they use, the processes they use, the tools they have. And I can't see unhappy people without coming up with ideas, ideas that'll help those people. And I might call those ideas products. I might call them features. I might call them enhancements. I might call them bug fixes. And eventually, when I tell someone else to do it, I'll call them requirements. It's important to remember that what we call requirements are, well, they're our best ideas about how to fix someone's problem. Now, at the end, we deliver something, and we deliver something into the world, not because we wanted the something. In fact, what we wanted later are these people that were unhappy to be happier. And they're not just happy because they have the, the software. They're happy because they do things differently. They behave differently as a consequence, and that's what makes them happier. And not everyone is happy, and some people are mad. You can't please everyone. So uh, here are the, the words that are most important. First, it's everything between that idea and that delivery. That's, that is output. That's what we make, and that's what we measure with velocity. And oddly, that's what we don't want. What we really want is the change that occurs out here. Now, the change that occurs quickly, uh, the, the change that I can measure almost immediately, is, is outcome. The annoying thing about outcome is you can't measure it until things come out. That's why it's called that. And uh, what we measure in outcome isn't how many features we delivered, how many story points we delivered. We measure outcome in behavior changes. How many people use our product? How many times they use particular features? How much our sales increases or our conversion rates increase as a consequence? And what we measure are people's behavior. Now. I build features to change people's behavior, to change their world. And ultimately, I'm building them to, well, to benefit my organization and maybe benefit others. But that long-term benefit, it takes a delivery of a number of features over time to, to actually affect a bigger change, like more profit in my company. And that longer-term change is, I'll use the word impact for that. Uh, in the, uh, is, is there a company in Russia yet called Groupon? Yeah, they entered this market. So, and then is, is Amazon.com in this market yet? So, so yeah, maybe. So in the U.S., Amazon is a is a monstrous company. And Groupon is also a wildly successful company that's that's surged. And Amazon has said, "Hey, Groupon, uh, you've been very successful with that, and we were go well. We'd like some of that market. We'd like to uh, duplicate that business model." So they release new functionality in the United States called Amazon Local. It offers, uh, lo it offers very deep discounts on services and things like that that are local, that are close by me. Now, as soon as they release that new service in the US, they can measure my behavior. They send me email messages, and they can see how many I open, how many I read, and how many I click through to to see on their website, how many I add to my shopping basket, and uh, how many I ultimately buy. There's a lot of outcome they can measure there. But they're really, you know, yes, their goal is for a lot of people like me to do that, but ultimately their goal is to, uh, well, to edge into Groupon's market share, to displace them. 
Now they can release their product uh, or, and changes to the product and they can check my behavior every time they release, but they can't check the day after they release something to see if they've displaced Groupon in the market. That's, that impact is going to take longer. Our job in software development is not to build more software, not even to build more software faster. Our job is to build less software. Our job is to minimize the amount we have to build and maximize the amount of benefit we get. That's uh, confusing in most waterfall processes because we focus so much on quantity and speed. I've got to talk about uh, the, the tough words here. Uh, the, the words that make software development work is the, the, the R word, uh, requirements, and the D word, uh, design. Now this is a guy named Fred Brooks. Fred Brooks wrote a number of papers that eventually were collected up into a book called The Mythical Man Month. Uh, he's notable, but one of the, one of the things uh, he said, and said this uh, two or th almost three decades ago now, is that the hardest single part of building software is deciding precisely what to build. It isn't building it fast, it isn't building it high quality, it's making decisions about what to build. And well, this person is a, it's a guy named Alistair Coburn. He's written multiple books, but is one of the people that brought us agile development. Uh, he happens also to be a friend and neighbor of mine, lived in my same city for, for the past decade. And he spelled it out very simply, that if it's your decision to make, it's design. If it's not your decision to make, it's a requirement. Now this is, uh, you, you see this when people at different, the edges of the waterfall start to interact with each other. If one person, let's say a business analyst or a product manager steps too close in to what a developer does and says, it, uh, well, it says something that starts to sound like technical design, the developer will say, now that's design, it's not your job. And uh, you just give me the requirements. And uh, well, it seems like uh, when the, the developer or, or when the business analyst or product person doesn't give enough information or step in close enough, uh, the person on the development side is, needs to fill in some details or make some decisions. Uh, if they fail to do that or don't do that, they will say, well, the requirements were incomplete. Those were bad requirements. And there is a demilitarized zone, a, a wall. A, a <laughs> particularly relevant uh, to uh, the relationship of America and Russia. That is a wall we don't want to penetrate here. And that starts to be the problem. Now, uh, the metaphor that works for me is if we're going to create outcome and impact, we have to start thinking about who we're building products for and, and how their behavior changes. In the United States, in the United States there is a, a, a a series that's been running for many years called, uh, called South Park. Has anybody seen South Park episodes before? We'll, we'll see if this translates culturally. Uh, it, oddly, whatever they do seems to be well, oddly relevant. And in South Park, there were reoccurring characters in early seasons called the underpants gnomes. The underpants gnomes would sneak into your room in the middle of the night and they would, well, they would steal your underwear. And in this particular episode, we actually get to learn about the business plan that they have that, that is driving this, this behavior. Some people may have seen this. I first heard this metaphor in a, a large finance company as I walked by a, a room where people were meeting and somebody, somebody looked at somebody and said, that sounds like an underpants gnome scheme, which made me stop and I hadn't uh, heard this. And uh, apparently, well, now if I Google the term underpants gnome scheme, I will find lots of people who've written about this from a business perspective as a way to describe a poorly thought through business plan. Now, phase two, uh, and, well, and frankly, in an agile process, and the way I see product ownership work, I see lots of, lots of user stories that, that basically equate to collect underpants. And uh, if we ask, well, why are we doing this, uh, I either get the blanks there, or uh, eventually you press hard enough and you will get profit, uh, or return on investment, or uh, some other such thing. If we think in terms of outcomes, we have to think in terms of who our software affects, how they'll benefit later, 
how we'll change their world. We're inventing products. We're changing the way people work. We are not delivering more iPhones or more widgets or more cars here. This is an invention game. Now, we, for better or worse, we end up being saddled with this word process. And we use the term process, and we think of, well, well we think of one thing, one thing after another. We think of a sequence of people doing different things and handing things off to each other. And uh, we think of, well, when I ask people to, I tell people, uh, think of the word process and then give me the first words that come to your mind. And they will often say uh, steps and flow and predictability and uh, sequence and rules and bureaucracy. And a, a number of words that aren't, uh, well, how that make it sound not very fun. Now, most uh, in agile development today, there, and I remember in 2001, Agile development referred to a kind of process, and there were a lot of different styles of Agile. Now, the styles have started to shrink a little bit. They've all started to converge under, uh, well, they're called Scrum these days. How many people here would say they're practicing or uh, trying to practice Scrum today? OK, uh, that's a lot. Uh, it's certainly more than 2 thirds of the room. Uh, how many people have seen that particular figure before? OK, uh, so a lot less. But, but this is from a paper written by two Japanese authors in the 90s. And this is where Scrum got its name. These two Japanese authors actually did a study of product design companies, people that design new products. Uh, and they're not talking software, people who design cars and printers and uh, uh, cars, printers, cameras, a variety of different things. And they looked at the processes that they followed. And they found some that were very successful and some that struggled. And they described three different kinds of process. The first process had these discrete phases where each phase happened after the other phase. And they had uh, b sharp beginnings and endings. And then they saw this other this type B process where, uh, well, the phases overlapped with each other, where there was a, a first phase, but uh, maybe a design phase, but it overlapped with a, a, a development phase. And there was a collaborative period in, in between, which looks like Royce's model with the, the second loops. But then they described something that even Royce didn't quite describe. It, they, they described this model where a phase starts and then continues on throughout the life of, of this whole process. And then the next phase starts and then continues on. And as you look at that model, it's really messy. And at any given time, all the phases overlap. And what happens when all the phases overlap is all the, the roles and responsibilities and, uh, well, all, everything starts to overlap and get messy. The, the author said that if you watch these people look, work, it does not look like a nice orderly process. It looks like they're playing rugby. And rugby is a sport with lots of uh, big, muscly guys that run around a field and, and kick a ball and kick each other. And uh, they try and win this game. But they all work together. And a quote from the paper is, under a rugby approach, the product development process emerges from the constant interaction of a hand-picked, multidisciplinary team who, whose members work together from start to finish. There aren't handoffs in, well, the, 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 there aren't handoffs of one phase to the next. Uh, in fact, if we're doing agile development right, it looks like rugby. It looks like, uh, well. That's where Scrum gets its name. Scrum is a particular time or a, a ceremony in rugby where when the ball, when there's a penalty and we have to stop play and we have to start play back up again, we'll put the ball in and there's a, uh, well, we have, we have a Scrum to get things rebooted, get things back uh, going. So the, the authors, well, the, the creators of Scrum read this paper and said, that's, that's what good software development is actually like. We want to be more like that. And I guess they had a choice to call it rugby, but that name was taken. And they weren't very creative, so they called it Scrum. That's why we call it that. And the point to keep in mind is that when we're doing software development right, it does not look like a process. It looks like a game. Games play very different than process. They're chaotic. They're violent. And when I ask people the same thing, if I say, um, if I say the word game, what are all the words that you, what are words that immediately come to mind? Ah, good, good. team, a fun, I hear. Cooperation. Uh, 
Win. Uh, oh, now we actually worry about winning. When we say process, no one thinks of winning. When I ask people process, no one thinks of team. Uh, when I talk about process, no one talks about cooperation. And, uh, and, and as soon as people say winning, then somebody will say losing. Um, and in process, we have this belief that if we practice the right process, we will always win. Which is a little like saying if we play a game and follow the rules, we will always win. That's stupid. <laughs> It doesn't work that way. Uh, in process, we think if we do it right, we will always win. And, but in games, uh, we know that following the rules uh, doesn't help you win. In fact, it takes skill. It takes lots of expertise. It doesn't take a two-day class, uh, and then you're able to join a professional hockey team. It takes thousands of hours of practice. So knowing how does it make you good, and we sort of forget that. Now, uh, there aren't roles and responsibilities in games. There are positions in games. Now, I don't know anything about most games, but I, I know that, well, in the hockey slide I just showed, was that the Moscow team? Did I, uh, I tried to make sure I uh, chose something relevant uh, to you guys, but uh, I know that there is this position called a, a goalie, a, a, a goaltender, and he tends the goal, and, and his, his job is to He'll to protect the team's goal, and when the puck comes towards him, he'll, he's got a lot more padding, and, uh, and he can protect that goal and, and get it out of there. But uh, suppose he uh, reaches to block a goal and, and uh, it goes off, and he's no longer in that box, and he's outside, and the puck comes back out, and, and the opposing team has the ability to shoot it right into that goal. And if one of the goalie's team members is right there and can block it, they should. They don't say, that's not my job. And we need to change the process so that the goal keep, we need to get two goaltenders. We need to get two goalies here, because that's the only way to prevent this from happening in the future. Uh, it, it, teams play together. They're, they're, when you play a position in a team, it doesn't mean you can't do others' jobs. It means that you're best at that one thing that you do, but, uh, and you're expected to look after that concern, but it doesn't mean you're the only one who can. And no one gets to the end of a game saying, we finished on time and respected all the rules. That's not winning. Uh, winning a game is pretty clear. And we know what that is. The process that people are starting to follow that, that do this, well, it's a, a mashup of a lot of things. So I want to start talking about the kind of way that we work that isn't, isn't a client vendor style of work. That it isn't pure scrum. We're using a process, these days I'll adapt a process that's based on something called design thinking. There's that, it's not called requirements thinking, by the way. It focuses on all of us making decisions about what to do. Now, it's a pretty straightforward process that seems like it should be common sense. There are these early steps, to the, well, this uh, empathize and define stage says we should really understand the people we're solving a problem for uh, and really understand the problems and then focus on a particular problem before we solve it. Then we should really, instead of just going with the first idea that comes to mind, we should consider lots of possible ideas. And then before we invest uh, well, thousands, millions into building something, we really ought to test, uh, maybe prototype and test, and confirm that it's actually going to solve our problems. Because we know that you know, most of our first ideas are bad, and, and uh, most of our ideas, even the best ones, need some adjustment and change. Now that all seems like pretty common sense, uh, but there's an old saying that there's nothing more uncommon than common sense. And sadly, if we're engaged in a waterfall-style process, our focus isn't on solving the problem. Our focus is on, well, safety. If you, whenever I show somebody a process like this, they automatically start thinking, oh, that's a process. Uh, calling it a process puts that assembly line metaphor back into our head, and we think these are distinct phases. Different people do different things at distinct phases. But remember the quote about Scrum, that it's not uh, a lot of the, the phases are going on all at once, and it's one collaborative team engaged in all of those phases. It's called design thinking because each of these are thinking steps. They're things we need to deliberately think about. And it's these people that work together to think about it. Now, 
it, it, doesn't, also, it doesn't go in a sequence. In fact, uh, we often start with ideas, and then we back up and ask questions like, oh, what, what problem are we trying to solve with this idea? Or we may even start by building a prototype or something and then back up from that. Uh, we may go all the way to building something and testing somebody and realize after we put this in front of people, we don't really understand these people. We need to go back and work to understand them. And when I'm sitting with someone and I see problems they've got, I cannot help. My head goes right straight through to coming up with ideas or solutions. The, the, it takes some discipline to, to know that uh, there are different thinking modes, and it takes discipline to make sure we understand problems, make sure we consider multiple ideas, to make sure we validate them. A design process may seem like common sense, but it's not the way our heads normally work. It take, it's hard to do that. Now, uh, this kind of a design process is rooted in that now and later model. I spend time understanding the world now, and I spend time out here imagining the world later. And when I imagine the world later, I'm thinking in terms of, well, I'm thinking in terms of uh, outcomes, in terms of how people change. And to understand the world now and to understand the world later, that doesn't happen inside the building. I need to get out into the world to do that. One of the companies I worked with actually just a couple weeks ago in New Zealand had well, they'd taken the, the signs on their door that said exit, and they uh, put something under it uh, that said uh, entrance to the research lab. It's the door out of your building that leads to where your problems, uh, to where your customers and users are, to where you'll solve them. Now, a design thinking process doesn't have a scrum master, or, well, it does have somebody who acts as a coach, and that coach sometimes gets referred to as a designer, but we start in a design thinking process, we start thinking of design not as a product that's produced in a phase, but as a whole process that we all participate in. Uh, Leah Bewley is a friend that was with a company called Adaptive Path, and uh, they're a big name in the design world. And a quote from her is that, it's design isn't a product that designers produce, it's a process that designers facilitate. Now, I borrow language from another person named Marty Kagan. Marty Kagan used to be in charge of product management at eBay. He's written a great book on product management called Inspired. And he will tell people that are product managers that it isn't your job to just figure out what the product is. Your job is to find a product that is valuable to our organization, valuable to customers and users who will buy it, and usable by them. Because if they can't use it, then, well, they won't get any value. They might buy it initially and then decide they hate it. Uh, but uh, it also needs to be feasible to build, given the tools and time that we've got. That's the ideal product. Now, any idiot can maybe identify, a, 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 we need this kind of feature. But it takes a little bit more effort to say exactly how it looks and behaves. And then uh, I often see people concoct these really fabulous, perfect designs. And then they hand them to development for an estimate and learn that they cost too much. Any idiot can come up with a really fabulous, expensive design that costs too much to build. Your job is to come up with something we can afford to build. The challenge is solving for all those problems. And we cannot solve for all those problems, or one person can't. One product owner can't. One customer role person can't. The, the, the way this concern plays out is we might take a person who's a product manager or a business person and pair them with someone who understands users. In the user experience community, that's a, an interaction designer, or in some organizations, that's a business analyst. But well, it's a person who actually spends time with people. And then uh, on the engineering, or on the feasibility side, it's an engineer. So organizations working like this build a team that is balanced. They're, first off, if you're fixing Scrum, start by making sure that there's not a single product owner. Start by making sure the product owner has a team of people that are responsible for finding a valuable, usable, and feasible product. It's those people that work together tightly and involve the rest of the team to build a backlog and steer Scrum. That's a balanced product ownership team that is led by a product, maybe led by someone we might call a product owner. But ownership lives in this team, and it lives in the whole team. Leadership is what we rely on a product owner for. Now, when you work this way, you may involve uh, people that uh, understands the business challenges. You'll involve people that have 
techni technical skills, you will involve people that understand users in the UI, and we'll even involve people that we actually involve our users directly. Uh, at a minimum, we spend time visiting them and working with them, but often we'll involve working with them collaboratively. Uh, I've worked with uh, people maybe who are probably familiar with a company called SAP in Germany, one of the largest software companies in the world. They're not famous for building products that people like, but they're trying to change that, and they know it, um, and they've adopted a design thinking process, and one of the, the things they're trying to do with new products is actively involve their customers in the design process. That act of, well, involving whole teams and customers together gets referred to as co-creation or co-making. The title of this talk is, uh, I like the word making better. It's a little more hands-on. And it's these people that work together to, to co-make. It's, uh, they're co-responsible. Uh, they're all responsible. And when these people work together to do this, it's hard to tell where the source of any one good idea comes from. Ideas come from someone, and they get built on and added to and elaborated by others. Everyone is making decisions. Everyone is designing. Requirements don't come from any one place. These people are co-makers, but the for organizations adopting this way to work, and for companies like SAP, this creates a big problem. When things go wrong, it's difficult to figure out who to blame. And it's, well, everyone takes the blame. These, when these people work together, they focus on, they've got to work together and work fast, so they, not only they do those things, they work very differently. They stop doing the thing that most people do in processes and create documents and exchange them. That doesn't work. When we share documents, it's not the same as understanding each other or sharing understanding. This is a cartoon that was used by a, there's a few frames to this. It's a cartoon that was used by a, a previous employer of mine, and I, I saw it used over and over in, in introduction talks, and I kind of uh, dismissed it. But it's only now that I realize that that's the mo most important thing. The idea is that we may share a backlog, we may share uh, descriptions of customers, we may share uh, requirements as features, and we may read them and we all say, yes, we, we're in agreement. But we all may be thinking very different things. Uh, it, in fact, when we actually take back out what's in our heads and represent them to other people, that we realize, oh, we don't, we're not seeing this the same way. And we, if we're working together effectively, we realize that Actually, it's not you're right and I'm wrong, or you're wrong and I'm right. It's that we all see uh, something valuable. We all see a piece of the puzzle. It's when we put things back together and we combine and refine things that we end up with a shared understanding. It's when we leave the room that we may still say the same feature name or the same customer name, but we have this state of shared understanding. A mantra, if, if you take a class on Agile development or Scrum, you'll hear the, the notion of visibility and transparency over and over. I'll tell you that's not the point and that's not enough. Just because you hang something on the wall doesn't mean that people understand it. Understanding takes a lot of discussion and working closely together and pointing and words and pictures. Sharing understanding looks a lot more like this. These are people at Edmunds.com and well, they're discussing sketches, ideas for, uh, to solve problems that they're working with, and one person describes their idea, and the goal of these people uh, isn't to make sure his document is right, it's to make sure that they understand. This tile of work, well, there's a book that's been out fairly, recent, uh, fairly recently called Game Storming. There's that game word again, and it isn't a book that comes from the Agile community about software development, it's a book that talks about effective collaboration. And it, well, it describes a way to work where we work together effectively. We share information with words and pictures. We decide together. It's that deciding together that builds shared understanding and alignment. We're all moving the same direction together, kind of like a team, like a real team. <laughs> if we work this way, this is another one, a book that comes from the Stanford Design School community. They're the current uh, champions of design thinking that gets into, into curriculum in schools. The Stanford design community talks about, well, we need space to support this way to work, and that space is called make space. There's that making word again. And we're making things together, but we're not checking code into a repository. 
We are putting information out where people can see it and discuss it and move it around. This is not the same thing as a task board on the wall in an agile team room. This is space where teams can actually all interact with it and change it. And the, the, what's on the wall changes as our understanding grows as we gather more information. If, if you've ever seen a well, if you've ever seen a television crime show uh, where uh, detectives are trying to solve a problem and they build a big crime board and it has photographs of people and lines that connect them and uh, uh, they leave that on the wall and it helps them see the big picture, the whole thing. Now, detectives in a TV crime show aren't told to clear off the wall when their meeting is over. They get to leave it on the wall, they get to build it over time, and that information stays there so they can build shared understanding until we catch the killer. That's the way space like this actually works. And effective make space has walls and tabletops, and well, because we sometimes we do set aside projects to work on something else, we need to actually pick up things and set them aside. So effective make space has at least a quarter of the space dedicated to storage. How do I store uh, big sheets uh, that have what models on them and put them uh, someplace where I can get back to them later? So teams working like this, uh, doing design work together, share responsibility, they're led by a product person, they all work together, and they engage in something that I'm going to refer to as deliberate discovery. Now, in agile development, we'll talk a lot about delivery. And by delivery, I mean well, we're going to plan out the details, maybe in a sprint planning session. We're going to design, develop the code. We'll test it to make sure it's right. We'll evaluate our progress with the number of story points completed or velocity. And at the end, we'll evaluate our quality. But for us, that means there aren't bugs. But discovery is about answering questions. It's about answering the what problems are we solving question. It's, uh, who are we solving them for? And have we identified a solution that, that they believe solves their problems? Can they actually use the solution and solve their problems? And there's that feasibility question again. Have we designed a solution we can afford to build in the time that we've got? There's a balance between these two things. They, they go together, and they're in a cycle. It's discovery work that drives delivery work. It's not a phase that we go through. We do all the discovery, identify the thing, because well, we may start with prototypes. Uh, we may start with well, really simple things to understand people, then prototypes, uh, and then, then working software. But we we've, we've complement these things. Now, I'm going to introduce a last character here, and then I've got to go through a lot of pictures of what discovery looks like. And I'll rope in a lot of the companies I've been talking about here. That's, that's Tom. Tom is in charge of the user experience, or the design, the, well, the people that spend a lot of time talking with users at Snagajob the company I started with. And he talks about his team, is the, the group there is so wrapped up in helping people that morale suffers when all they do is focus on velocity. All they do is build software. The people at that company actually want to know if people are using their product, if they like it, and if it works. When I walk into the company, there are uh, things painted on the wall that, uh, well, they, they claim to have, they, they have no apologies for being really passionate about the, the customers and users that use their software. Uh, they remind people that uh, to say hi to and talk to the people that use their product. Uh, it's, it's oftentimes when I see signs like this, I think it's just noise. It's not real. But oddly for them, it's real. I see the same characteristics out of people that work at Disney. People that work at Disney actually do care if you have a magical day. People that work at Apple actually do take pride in the products that they build. And it's companies like this that, that, that all share ownership of their product. So this is what discovery looks like. It's a lot of working together to explore things. Now, I'm known for a modeling practice called story mapping. It's, it's a term I coined, but it's a practice that I've seen a lot of other people do. The basic idea here is that I'm using lots of cards and other things to have us, uh, help us build shared understanding. It isn't about building a backlog. It isn't write, about writing good stories. It's about understanding the product we're building. This is the result of a, di a day's worth of conversation with this guy, Gary, about his product. And the conversation starts by talking about why he's building the product uh, and what his goals are for it. And as we have the conversation, we don't let our words vaporize. We use words and pictures, and we write things on cards and 
place, place them out there where we can see them and point back to them later. We then go into more detail about the users who will use his product and uh, who's most important to serve. And then we tell, we, uh, Gary's already got a strong vision for his product, so let's, uh, I want to explore that vision. So we will talk about the, well, tell me about a day in the life of someone using this product. Uh, first they do this, then this, then this, then this, and we can tell a really long story about it. And then we can break that story down into, we can stop at any one of those steps and we can go into a lot of details about oh, what might people see on the screen and, and what are the optional things they might do here. And it's after all that that we really start to understand the product. Now, these are all stories that could go into an agile backlog, especially the little ones here, but it's everything above them that provides structure, that provides a, a backbone, a skeleton that, that lets Makes, helps us make sense of it. It's all the information about goals and users and, and the, the flow that does that. Now, now this, is a, this is a person that's, this is a team that's worked together to build some personas. Has anyone in the room used a persona in their company before? Now, the, what changes, I've worked with user experience people a lot, and what changes when you're doing this co-creating, co-making style is, it, again, it isn't about creating a really great persona, it's about creating shared understanding. So even if we produced a really well-researched persona, we'll often go into a room, bring the data, and as a team, discuss it and record the persona, or record what, we've, what we're, the decisions we're making about what details are relevant about the persona and what we'll do about it on flip chart paper. The quality we're looking for in handwritten documents well, it's the quality you get out of a vacation photo. How many people, I'll check and see if you're still awake here, how many people take photos on vacation? When you share those photos with somebody else, how, do they understand what you did on your vacation? And when you look at those photos again later, do you remember where you were that day and how warm it was and maybe what things smelled like and uh, other things you did? Well, when people look at things like this, they remember, it's not the words on the paper, they remember. They remember the conversations, they remember the conflicts, they remember the decisions. A flood of information not on that paper comes back. Translating them to something electronic does not help. Just as if I were to take your vacation photos and write you a nice document that describes it, wouldn't help. These are personas built by Edmunds.com, the, the guy where, um, uh, the place where Eugene works, and these are their personas. It turns out those pictures that are drawn there were drawn by somebody in finance. Apparently, he had this uh, artistic skill that was just waiting to come out, and uh, suddenly working on a team where he could actually show people that he could draw made him want to. People like being creative. Now, the, these are people at a company called Globo, and well, one of the people there is a developer, and one of them is a UI designer. Can you guess which is which? <laughs> and then don't stereotype. <laughs> now, but they built these personas together, but they build them together pairing at a computer because the developer wants to pair at a computer, so they pair. So they look electronic, but uh, the, the, them, they remember the pairing experience. Uh, these are, well, uh, I built software for many years for large chain retailers, uh, companies that had uh, you know, 100 to up to 1,000 stores. And we took on a chain of large paint stores and interior decorating stores. And we had to, I had to very quickly learn how to sell custom blinds. Now, the, the way to do that was to pull in these three ladies that sold custom blinds. And we, sold, we brought them in from different places in the United States. And we worked with cards on a table. And uh, we used uh, little bits of wrapped candies to mark things that were high priority, and it was fun. And these people quickly learned that there wasn't one simple process for this, that they all did things very differently. So it's not us getting requirements from them. It's all of us co-making and starting to build shared understanding. The person ignoring everyone at the back of the room is a project manager. <laughs> Don't know what that means. Uh, when I go through my hard drive, I, you can't just, I bring people in, but you can't understand people. Um, sometimes I'll use the, the metaphor as a, well, Jane Goodall was uh, someone who just studied chimpanzees and apes and things like that. Have people heard of Jane Goodall? Uh, imagine if someone had come up with a, a, a process innovation for Jane and she said, look, Jane, all we have to do is put monkeys in cages and bring them right to your desk. 
we'll call this monkey on sight. And if ever you want to learn something about a monkey, they'll be right there and you can watch them. Well, it turns out that doesn't work very well. Monkeys on site do not behave the same as monkeys in the forest. And uh, your customers and users don't behave on site the same way that they behave when they actually do their work. And this is us getting up early in the morning to work with the finance manager of a bank to see how he does what he's doing. And I'm behind the camera, and we're watching him work, and he's telling us how he does the job. Remember, a first step in, a design, in the design thinking process, or one of their first steps, was empathy. Empathy doesn't, isn't the same as research. It's not the same as collecting data. It's us feeling this person's pain and problems. It's us understanding it at a deeper level. If I go through my hard drive, I see lots of pictures of people working on screens. And this is me take, and people telling us how they do things. And this is me actually doing work to get empathy. This guy trades. Uh, he, he manages stock portfolios uh, working, for a, working for a company. Well, uh, we were building stock portfolio management software. And I said, great. Uh, we need to, need to, I need to better understand these portfolio managers and what they do and how they work. And they said, oh, they're very busy people. Their, their time is very valuable. We will see who wants to talk to you, and we'll make some appointments for you, and you can meet them in conference rooms. And I said, oh, OK, that's interesting. What floor are they on in the building? They're on the third floor, but you can't go there. I said, OK. And uh, out of curiosity, could we take uh, pictures of the space they work in? And they said, oh, no, you, you can't do that. You need, a, well, first off, it's a highly sensitive information. If you took any pictures, you would need to get permission from legal to do that. And I said, OK. And I went over to the elevator. I pressed the third floor. I went down, and there's a bunch of people who work like this. And they said, wow, no one ever comes to talk to us. Uh, <laughs> have a seat. Let me show you how I do things. Uh, oddly, how it's, it's, I see that pattern over and over, that the, the reasons we can't talk to somebody are made up by the people who don't want us to talk to somebody. They don't actually, they don't actually come from those people. I've got lots of pictures of people doing work. Uh, I've got a, uh, these also are stock portfolio managers, but they work in a portfolio, and they work together as a team. One of the stories in the backlog for this product was, because they work together in a team, somebody said, well, they need a chat feature. They need to be able to type in messages to each other because they need to collaborate very quickly. And I said, look, they have arranged their desks so they can face to each other, face each other and talk all day. For them, chat means chat. It doesn't mean type things into a window. They already do it. Stop building that feature. Uh, this is them uh, stuck because their models failed that morning. And well, when we come out and do things like this, Many of us break off and go into different directions to learn, and we need to build shared understanding about what we saw. This kind of map is referred to as a journey map or an empathy map. Well, it has the steps that people take. Uh, it, that they've knitted in photographs that uh, to help people see what's going on there. They knit in questions and comments and ideas and pain points. They knit it. They help. We want. We want to understand not exactly what people do, but where they hate it. Because that's our job. Remember the now and later model. Our job is to find pain and fix it. This is a group of people at Globo. I'm going to start to move uh, a little bit faster. They're thinking through a new product. And this is the small team together. Uh, actually, you'll recognize the shirt the guy's wearing is the guy in the photograph earlier. And uh, they're thinking through a new design for their product, and the, that line of cards is them imagining the perfect, the ideal product, and telling the, the journey of people doing that. Uh, and they're, well, they're building a product that helps people download shareware products. And uh, in Brazil, they have to also do work to rewrite the instructions and download, uh, download instructions and usage instructions into Portuguese uh, because they, they don't read English. And they imagine that ideal experience, and then they start seeing, OK, this, this group of cards here, they'll mark it with a pink card and say, that's about where people are. Their goal here is they're, trying, they're doing these things to make a decision about what to download. They're doing these things to actually get it downloaded and installed. They're doing these things here in order to serve this goal of giving feedback and comments and sharing information with each other. As these people talk, you can see the story growing, both in breadth and depth. People will ask me, what is the difference between those bright green cards and the other cards? 
Nothing, they just ran out of the, the other cards. But it's evidence that the story is growing, and it's evidence that they keep changing the story and ripping it up. Their goal is to really, well, is to, to understand. There's no requirements collection here. This is another person, uh, well, he's working with uh, the guy at a bank, that's uh, Brian. Uh, the, the role of pink cards, it describes the way he works. It tells a long story about a month-end process that he goes through, and it's hard. When people are using models like this, they can use really useful words like this and that and over here. <laughs> Those are words you cannot use when you're working with a spreadsheet or a backlog. Brian is passionate about this, partly because he's Italian and partly because this is his life. When Mark, that person, listens to Brian describe problems, Mark gets ideas on how to fix those problems, what software we could build. This isn't requirements capture, this is problem solving. These people are working together to do it. Now, I've showed a lot of pictures of pe people working with cards. Uh, it's not just cards, we have to start drawing pictures of how this looks. And we don't say, this is not a waterfall process where we say, you are a designer, now you draw pictures. You bring them back to us and we will tell you why you're wrong. No, we all draw them together. We take some time independently. These are people at Edmunds.com. They're working independently to draw and then coming back and sharing their stories with other people. And the goal isn't to be a good artist. The goal is to communicate ideas because they've all got ideas. Good UI designers make our ideas better, but it's not, they're not the ones that come up with all the ideas. Now, the slide I showed before, again, our goal is to communicate our ideas and for people to understand them. And uh, again, we've got to use words and pictures. This is the same Globo team again. They'll stabilize what they understand about what they're doing and then move forward from here to make it visible. Now, they're building a simple paper prototype, and they're building it out of paper, out of slips of paper, so they can have a discussion about the UI and how it might look and change things around during the discussion. They don't want to do this in a tool because they all want to be able to make choices and make changes. And because it's, well, they could tell the uh, UI designer to go off and use Photoshop or some other tool to create these UI pieces, but the developers say, hey, I can just query the database directly and pull images directly out of it and format them on some, well, do some little queries and we'll put them on a web page and print them out. Uh, uh, I don't know if this is a prototype, I don't know if this is a technical or not technical, but these guys are working together and they create something that's real. And while they're working really dynamically, uh, it's funny, at the end of this video, they put all their computers back on and get boring again. Uh, that's it. Uh, it will work to, these are people that snag a job and uh, the, the types of sketches that they build that combine uh, pencil and photographs and other things, and their goal is to imagine the later world. And you can imagine the later world. These people are testing using a paper prototype. Has anybody ever used a paper prototype this way to test? A few people have. Good. This is sometimes referred to as Wizard of Oz testing, because in the old uh, Wizard of Oz movie, you're supposed to pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Uh, he's the wizard, or he's the computer, and in front of him is his memory and all the screens, and she's not a, a business analyst or someone else. She's someone that actually has to do the work. These aren't, this is, looks, may look trivial, but these people are with Hewlett Packard. They're exploring a new drag and drop user interface for managing, uh, well, they're with the storage works division, and they manage rooms full of disk arrays. And when I'm mapping logical to phys physical units, that's kind of complicated. And the UI they have today is complicated, and they want to explore some alternatives. They want to do it quickly and cheaply. Now, teams that work like this, it's going back to the teams at Edmonds. Uh, Edmonds has adopted a process where everyone engages in deliberate discovery, and teams spend a lot of time talking with each other and sharing what they're doing with other teams. It's a way for them to check their ideas. In fact, so many teams are doing this, at the end of every week, they will, uh, on Friday morning, every, the teams doing this gather in the lunchroom of the company, they set up small booths, and then they show what they've done to everyone else. It's like a trade show, or I think even at the conference here, you'll see a, a hall where there's lots of vendors there, it feels like that, except these are teams sharing what they've done with other people in their company, and the other people get to learn from each other, and they get to ask tough questions of each other. And they'll fill a room full of these things. 
Now, when we're doing deliberate discovery, we're driving towards the answer to the question of what can people build, or excuse me, what can we build, what do people want, and what is usable by them. And remember, our job in software development is to build as little as we possibly can. It's not to build as much as we possibly can. Now, the term that's used for the pr smallest product that we can build that people want, that satisfies our needs, is the term minimal viable product. Does anybody use the term MVP in their organization? Now, I see the anti-pattern where the term MVP means crappiest thing I could possibly build. That's not what it means. It means the product that actually changes the world. And if no one uses your product, that's not the change you were looking for. Now, to figure out what people will build, we need to do this other process that comes from the lean startup community. And that's embedded in this. And we have to build something. We have to get out into the world and, and measure or observe or see what people did. And when we do that, we learn something. The lean startup community has made things confusing for me because they also use the term MVP. But they mean something else. They mean minimal viable product experiment or the smallest thing we could possibly build to learn something. It isn't the smallest thing that customers or users want. In fact, the purpose of discovery work is to do lots of cycles around this build, measure, learn cycle until we actually learn, well, lots of lean startup minimal viable product experiments until we actually learn what the minimal viable product is for our customers. And that's the one that we'll release. And it's that the one. We, we don't stop measuring there. We keep learning. But uh, hopefully now we're actually able to earn money off this thing. So with everything we build, we should be able to learn something or earn something, not measure velocity. Now, let's see if we can tighten back up here. This is the, the, the task board for the, the folks at, at uh, Snag a Job, the people I started the story with. They're sad today because at the end of their task board is this column that has things that are ready for release, and they tag them with those pink stickies when they've released them. But the next column has metrics. It has the measurements they're going to pay attention to when it releases. And the card will not leave the board until they've measured and had a discussion about it, and until they've learned something. They're sad today because they're focused on, for their site, revenue per visit. And unfortunately, well, there's other things there. The revenue per visit has dropped 2%. They've learned what most people learn is the stuff we build doesn't go the way we planned. And our good ideas that we hoped would actually make a positive change in the world or people's behavior make a negative change. This is an, uh, there's a video online that you should find from the folks at Nordstrom. This is JB, the person I started with. I'm not going to play the whole video, but maybe just the tail end of it here. It's on YouTube. But it describes them trying to really push this build, measure, learn process really fast. Uh, the video was written up by Eric Reese as an example, but they're a group that I've worked with before. They run a, they, they're a department store, and they had the idea for an application that would be in the sunglasses department, where if I'm trying on multiple pairs of sunglasses, uh, I can try one on, try another one on, and then compare them side by side and figure out which ones I look best in. It's hard to do in real life. Uh, they actually, to do this, to speed up the cycle, they actually went out to the store, put developers in the store, and built the application over and over so that they could build it and have someone look at it right away. Uh, they did this over the course of one week. It's, uh, it's showing it and using it to people many times a day that allowed them to build, measure, learn as fast as possible. This is the beginning of the video. I'm J.B. Brown, the Nordstrom Innovation Lab Manager, and this is the lab. We work on one-week experiments. Somebody will have an idea and we'll find a way to figure out how to prove if the idea is going to work. And this week, the Innovation Lab is going to be building an iPad app with customer feedback as we go through the week. We wanted to work in the store to make sure that we were getting customer feedback as we worked so that we were never working on anything that wasn't valued by the customer and only doing things that are delivering value. So we'll be building a feature and testing it until we get to the point where we have something that's good enough that we can just leave and leave the iPad app behind and have this new thing that customers can use. 
This is the world's first flash build. It's a flash mob where a software team shows up and builds an application in a surprise location. This is the Nordstrom Innovation Lab, and we're at the flagship store in downtown Seattle. Right now, the team is just setting up their equipment to get started. We're going to build an iPad app that helps customers pick the best pair of sunglasses for them. We really don't know what the features are yet. We're going to use customer feedback as we go along throughout the day and the rest of the week in order to build the best thing. So the next thing we're going to do is a user story map. So we're going to sit here and together outline all the steps that a customer would take and actually even beforehand how they buy sunglasses, like what are the, the different things that they might do and how that process might change if we have this application. I'm going to move on to the end here. The video is a few more minutes that I want to spend. But uh, you see what they're trying to do, and the day starts with them trying to get empathy, trying to get understanding of what people do. Doesn't start with requirements gathering. Doesn't start with, uh, uh, well, it, it, it starts with everybody trying to understand the big picture, not figure out what is the highest priority story. So yesterday, the sunglass buyer for Nordstrom came down to check out our progress, and she happened to put on polarized glasses, and then held up the iPad in portrait view, and was surprised that she couldn't see anything because it was black. And we figured out that the polarization of the iPad running up and down, and the polarization of the glasses running vertical, cancel each other out, you don't see anything. But if you turn the iPad to landscape, you see perfectly fine because of the polarization of the two items line up, and it's okay. So it was a pretty good find to be in the store, and she just happened to put on polarized glasses. And so today, for by building something uh, that you learn what you can anticipate, doesn't matter how good you are at this process, doesn't matter how many checkpoints you put in place, the fastest way to catch that uh, isn't with a process, it's with actually doing the work. Salespeople just naturally pick up. it up and use it in landscape and not try and go to portrait. Okay, so I'm going to show you what we've been working on the last five days. We've added quite a few features over the week. You take a picture, multiple pictures of the customer, and then you can pull them up and tap the first one. You can see it um, larger and then tap the second and do a side-by-side -side comparison of each glass next to each other. We also added a feature where you can rename the picture because we heard from salespeople, if a customer's trying on quite a lot of glasses, it's helpful to be able to know what order they were taken in and also rename if you want with the brand or some distinguishing feature of the glass. Another feature we added was the ability to zoom. You can zoom in and really get a good detailed look at the frame side-by-side. -side. Also, to see one of the pictures larger if you want to just a better view of one frame. You can flip the camera view as well. Face it forward so the salesperson can take a picture of it like this, or you can flip the camera like so take a picture of uh, yourself facing forward. And then at the end of it all, we have a button called New Customer, which just erases all of the images and allows the salesperson to start with a new customer. We're just trying to put the final touches on the app, tell talk to a lot of users, and they said that when we went into the compare view, it was unclear where the pictures were coming from and which picture was which. So the animation here is trying to solve that problem, make it a little more clear what's going on. One of the challenges with software is when you're done, right? And I think the answer is really, it depends on how much time you have. At least the most important things got done. So this was... I'm gonna stop there. Gosh, when uh, Dimitri told me I had over an hour to talk, I thought, okay, fine, I'll be able to include everything I wanna talk about and have a lot of time for questions. Uh, I'll often tell people that I'm a a developer and I've been a product manager, which means I'm bad at estimating and I want everything. So let me wrap, let me give the, the punchline here, which will finish on time, but not leave a lot of time for questions. Here's the real problem. This is that Marty Kagan guy, and in traveling, uh, we were driving someplace in a car, and I'm asking some questions, and he said, basically said to me that if you're really good at this stuff, you're right about half the time. And I went, whoa, you mean if you're really, really good, you're wrong more than half the time? Yeah, that's the way it works. In fact, most people are wrong about 70% of the time, and the crappy people are wrong only you know, once in a while. Uh, that's like, that can't be. Marty, if we do all these things the right way, aren't we going to be right a lot? No, that's not the way it works. And I asked uh, Eugene, uh, the, the guy at Edmunds.com, who's been practicing this way now for a few years, and uh, he said, nope, that's, that's the way it is. We're right about two in 10 times, which means they actually check to see if people like and use the stuff they do, and instead of building more crap faster, they actually take the crap out. Uh, it's not in their system anymore. Now, there's a, this, this study is often shown to people. It's a Standish Group study, often called the Chaos Report, and it says this tragic thing, like, uh, depending on the year of the study, anywhere between 65 and 75 percent of the features we use, are, we build, are rarely or never used. 
Well, that starts to reconcile with what Marty and other people are saying. It's not, there's, not the, there's no tragedy there that Agile fixes. It's, well, the, the formula is that a lot of what we build seems like a good idea at the time, and we find out later that in spite of all of our testing and good intentions, it wasn't. I don't know who's old enough to remember poor Clippy. Uh, let's uh, rewind. Good, some people know what that is. It's uh, in a room full of technologists. Uh, required movie to watch for almost everybody is, is The Matrix. Now, uh, has anybody not seen The Matrix before? So I'll explain a little bit. This, uh, uh, well, this super versatile actor, Keanu Reeves, pl plays this guy, Neo, and uh, he's a computer hacker that suspects that there's really there's something wrong with the world. It's not right. And, uh, and he uh, meets this uh, guy, Morpheus, who says that actually the world isn't right. Uh, in fact, the world is, is not what you think it is. And uh, we can uh, actually show you what the real world is. It, but I'll give you a choice here. You can take a red pill or a blue pill. If you take the blue pill, you will forget any of this happened, and you'll go back to the world the way it is. Or you can take the red pill, and you'll see, it will, will take you out of the matrix, and you'll see the world for what it is. So uh, the movie would have ended right there, and that would have been awful. But, uh, but he did take the red pill. And he got pulled out of the matrix. And what he learned was that the world was far worse than he could ever imagine. It sucked. It was awful. It was miserable. And, uh, and well, the choice is, do you go back to pretending everything's OK, or do you stick with the world as it is? Uh, I started this story with these people that were sad. And the, the truth is that most of what we build doesn't work out. And if we pay attention to whether we're successful or not, we're going to be sad a lot. In the world where we actually care where people, whether people like our products, in a world where we actually care if they use them or we get value, we have to cope with the notion that we are wrong a lot. And we can either go back to the waterfall process and focus on velocity and focus on uh, uh, who's to blame when things go wrong, or we can stay in a world where, well, where we actually do some good. I'm going to stop there. Uh, those are the three people that I talked about before. And that thing that says questions there, that's not going to work. Uh, we need to wrap up now. And I'm happy to answer questions for people. There's a lot of organizations I work with this and work with doing this kind of work. And uh, it's my goal in life to, to fix agile development so it actually is about making good products. Okay. Thank you for listening. Раз, раз, раз. Не слышно. Um, коллеги, uh, сейчас у нас перерыв. Давайте, если есть у кого-то пару вопросов. Uh, есть вопросы? Uh, we can ask a couple of questions. No questions. Okay, anyway, so Jeff uh, will be available day to day, so you can come. Thank you, Jeff. It's wonderful. It's out of the hall. <laughs>